Thanks for tuning in. I'm Ben Aston, and this is the Digital Project Manager Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Clarison, the leader in enterprise project and portfolio management software. Visit clarison.com to learn more. Today, I'm joined by Robin Reynolds, one of our resident DPM experts at the Digital Project Manager and Agony Aunt for Dear DPM, our Ask a Digital PM, whatever you like. So Robin, thanks so much for coming on the show again. Hi, Ben. I'm so excited to be back. I always enjoy chatting with you. <laughs> Good stuff. So I wonder, have you ever found yourself in a pickle because you were pretty sure you were doing a really good job at keeping the client up to date with everything on the project? But then one day, disaster hits the project and all those emails, the messages, the texts that you thought you'd sent the client about the project just seem to have magically disappeared. That, my friends, is why you need a status report. So today we're talking all about those dreaded status reports. Are they really necessary? And if they are, what should we put in them? How can we make them less of a pain and what can we do to actually make them useful? But if you've not yet met Robin, let me introduce her properly. Robin lives just down the road from me. That's kind of what I like to think. And uh, she lives in Portland and she likes emojis, lists and puppies. So uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. But just to say, as one of our DPM experts, Robin is also going to be making an appearance on our upcoming course, which is Mastering Digital Project Management. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about and you need some PM training, check it out. It's a seven-week crash course that includes some interactive video sessions, uh, weekly lessons, assignments, group discussions, and also there's the option of coaching sessions too. So head to digitalprojectmanagerschool.com and get yourself signed up. We've just got a few places left. But Robin, you've recently moved jobs. So tell me about your new gig. Yeah. um, So I'm just wrapping up my first couple of weeks at the quote, quote, new gig. And it's been absolutely fantastic. I'm now working for 10up. And essentially what we do is help to make the web better by finally crafting websites and tools for content creators. What's really fun about 10up is that everybody is remote, 100% of us. And we work with the likes of AMC, NBC Universal, Time Inc, etc. Cool. So if everyone if everyone's working remote what time zone are you working in is it just is it north america or is it is it other countries too well luckily we have um such organization and that we're in different groups and pods so i'm technically in a pod that's all on pacific coast time and then there's a european pod and so on and so forth um some days i'll have a meeting maybe a little bit earlier than i'd like but those are pretty far and few in between Cool. So, and do you get the opportunity to to switch pods if you think, oh, hold on, I want to, oh, I'd like to go to Europe for the summer. Can um, you do you a, pod, know, a pod trade? What's so funny is one of our team leads just did that. And so now she's over in Europe having the time of her life and traveling and also managing her team. Well, there we go. Sounds pretty cool. So how, what are the kind of challenges that, uh, I mean, you, you've done remote project management before but have you worked in this kind of environment where everybody is remote all of the time is there any kind of unique challenges that you found from that yeah so um you know i'd been working remote in my previous gig but what's really fabulous about um 10 up is that they really encourage everybody to work within their own time zones and we're huge advocates of using zoom as a video Uh, tool. So that's really great for working with clients and connecting with your team is that video is the expectation. It's not just the phone. It's not just an optional extra. Right. You're expecting (laughs) to have the video on. Yeah. And and people do that. That actually works. So far. Yeah, definitely. But, you know, it's also, um, I'm just in the beginning stages. I'm the new girl. So right now I'm just trying to own that I don't know it all. And I'm really trying to learn and listen and get to know my teams and clients and build those relationships. So yeah. So what is there anything that you found like from in moving to a new role that you're like, oh, I really need to get better at that? Um you know, I think it's just being owning the fact that you've done this job before. And there's always a little bit when you start a new role of imposter syndrome where you're like, oh my gosh, have I done this before? And it's like, yeah, no duh. It's just a different environment. And so I think, um, you know, just trying to be more confident in, in owning your projects. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so true. When, you, when you're 
when you're starting out in a new place, yeah, suddenly you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to do anything here. Like, how yeah, do you like, do? I'm the stupidest I, person. Yeah, I don't know how to get any resources for my project. <laughs> I mean, that that is an interesting one. So, how how do they do? Like, how is resourcing done, and what's the toolkit that they use there? Sure. Um, so we are using a combination of 10,000 feet. And um, also we have our own proprietary sort of project scheduling tool. So between those mm. two things, every everybody plays nicely. And I tend to get the resources I need for my projects. We also do a lot of you know, future planning several months out so we can avoid conflicts pretty well in advance. That sounds that sounds very grown up. So and um what, so what, what are the kinds of projects that you're actually working on? Can you talk about any of those? Yeah, well, I can't tell you exactly what the client names are, but I can tell you that it's a mix of web maintenance retainers and full site redesign and rebuilds using WordPress. Nice. Secret. Good stuff. <laughs> That's very, <clears throat> sounds very general. WordPress stuff. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about status reports. Now, at, at Tenup, have you written your first status report yet? I certainly have. <laughs> and we have our own format and approach for it, just like every agency, shop, person can do it differently. Yeah. So, I mean, what's your take? I mean, obviously, you've just written a, an article on status reports, but, but sell them to us. Why, why do you think status reports are worth doing? Well, Ben, let's face it. Nobody likes status reports or creating them. It's pretty, it's like the worst part of your <laughs> job at times, right? It's not very sexy. Um, it's a lot of times viewed as like, oh, I have to do this, but nobody's going to read it. But they are so important. And the best project status reports create accountability and ownership with your team. They uncover issues. They mitigate risks. And most of all, they ensure that you're on track towards your project goals. So with not only your internal teams, but for clients especially, it provides value. It's giving your clients confidence that their money is delivering on the project and it can make them look good to their bosses because they can like forward it up to different stakeholders. Um, finally, status reports can totally save your ass and that you have a paper trail in case things go off the rails. You can say, yes, we up leveled this risk to you. Here was our mitigation plan for it. Here's what we've done to correct it. Um, and hopefully that way, it's not like, oh, this was coming down the, the shoot for a long time and we forgot to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think there's a, I mean, when we're doing status reports, the temptation can be just to be like, ah, uh, well, I'll just let it slip this week because I don't think the client is actually reading this anyway, because last week I sent it to them and I, included a little easter egg in there where i said i think we're going to go over budget and they didn't totally. say anything <laughs> so now that i said that last week i'm not going to update them this week just in case they, they right. read it i told them so now it's over <laughs> yeah um, and it's it's really about managing expectations on a regular basis mm. um, Wait, so what are the internal team yeah so what are the kind of essentials then i mean my kind of perspective on status reports is, well, let's make them as simple as possible uh, because you don't want this thing to take two hours to update. And if you, you know, working with four different clients, that's going to take you like a whole day just to do your status report. So for you, what are the absolute essentials that we've got to include within it? Absolutely. So Ben, I'm with you. I think the simpler a status report, the better. You can really spend a lot of time on these things and turn them into project plans or just iterations of your project plan. But I recommend you don't do that. So the essentials would be your project name, client name, your project vision or summary. That should be like a one sentence thing. Um, project health this is very, very important, as you mentioned. There's a lot of different ways you can approach this on your status report that you can find out more about in the article. Um, but it absolutely needs to include hours or how you're tracking on the project, if you're on track in terms of timeline and budget. Also, what you need to include is what was recently completed on the project. So typically what I like to do here is link out all of the recent tasks that I've completed and then direct them to the PM tool if that's shared with the client. Um, below that, you're going to want to include what you plan to complete next. So 
which likely it's like in the next month or maybe in the next week, but it's giving the client a heads up that these are the upcoming priorities and this is what we're going to tackle. And that way the client can come back and say, actually, this isn't a priority anymore, or let's up-level this one instead. Finally, on your status report, you want to include issues and roadblocks. This is essentially um, where you're going to be up-leveling any potential risks that could happen and try to mitigate solutions with the client during your status review. Cool. So that, I mean, if, if, the, if those are the essentials, that still sounds like, a, that still sounds like a lot of stuff. So yeah. how, how much, I mean, it's all, it's all important stuff, but obviously, I don't know, maybe like a third of that is kind of static every week. So that, that mm-hmm. there's something, there's some things that aren't going to change, but then how do you, you know, how much detail is enough detail and how much, you know, it, when you're, it's, I like what you're saying about, task completion and task coming up and linking out your tool so it's just a it's just kind of like a a snapshot where they can deep dive if they want to but in all these kind of descriptions of what's going on and risks how much how much detail are you including to make it useful but uh, also making it so it doesn't take you hours to complete yeah i'd like to make sure that my project status reports don't take more than about 20 minutes Definitely, they're going to take a little bit longer up front when you make that first one. Um, But also, as project managers, I use this time to really sort of um, meditate on the project and make sure that I am understanding where everything's at. So a lot of times I may put in, uh, I may do a first draft earlier in the morning or maybe the day before I want to issue it and just kind of dump all of my ideas and thoughts and notes. And then I'll come back to it and edit all that fluff out to make it super concise. So can you say it's simpler? Can you just link to the task, right? And then discuss it over a call. Um, You want to make sure that you're not trying to solve all the issues in your status report, only identify and then direct and discuss. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's a really good point because I think there's the one way of looking at status reports is, well, we have to do them because, you know, the documentation that the client asks for, but never reads. But the flip side of that and the other way of looking at it is actually this is a really important tool for us as we're trying to keep our kind of finger on the pulse of the project and having that rigor of actually taking the time out each week to really do a deep dive into what's happening uh, to kind of reassess the risks, reassess your kind of uh, your mitigation strategy against those risks to think about, okay, what have we done this week? What do we need to do next week? And kind of get one step ahead of the team. It's actually a really useful exercise in that kind of ongoing project planning that's that we need to do to keep our projects on track and to really know where a project is at. I think otherwise we can sometimes just be tempted just to, you know, our project can just kind of bumble along and we can kind of forget to see the bigger picture of, of where our project is heading. Do you find that too? Absolutely. And, you know, for thinking in terms of racy, right, it's like project managers are responsible for creating that status report, but our team and our clients are accountable for being informed and reading and up leveling any questions or asking for clarification based upon that status report. Yeah, definitely. And I think, I mean, does, uh, what's your kind of methodology at TenUp? Is it more waterfally or is it, are you running, are you running sprints? and go more agile? Uh, we do a combination of both. So it depends mm-hmm. on the project. We're not married to to one or the yeah. other. Because I think one of the things that I've seen as well is that um, a temptation on more agile projects where there's where there's sprints, um, you know, where there's a, a huddle or a scrum every day and, you know, you're working in sprints and there's a, a sprint review and then the sprint retrospective uh, the temptation can be to be like, oh, well, we don't need to do status reports because everyone kind of knows what's going on, right? But I think there's one thing, <laughs> there's one thing of people kind of being engaged in the project and and kind of, well, and, and knowing what's going on on a kind of day-to-day level. But then it's that taking a step back and saying, okay, guys, do you realize how many hours we've got left? Um, do, you know, do you realize where the budget's at? Do you realize... Right. Do you, do you realize kind of how much more there is to do? And the Scrum is great at providing, if you're reviewing like the burn down chart, it's great for kind of taking a kind of quick look at that, but actually giving the client all the information and having all that, 
all those project details on condensed into a page or two is a is a really helpful exercise, even if you're running agile projects. Absolutely. I can totally agree with that. And also, as I mentioned earlier, your client may share it with their boss or some other important executives or stakeholders that could potentially bring in more money to your to your business. So, yeah, yeah, always useful. Do your status reports. But so after you've done your status report, then what's your kind of uh, what do you do with it? Do you to uh, stick it in an email? I think this is what the temptation can be. You uh, you finish your status report and it's, you know, Friday at four o'clock and you're like, OK, well, I'll just stick this in an email and um, disappear <laughs> and send it off to the client and uh, like hope for the best. But uh, how do you what, what do you do with your status reports after, after you've made them? Um, well, number one, I try not to send them on Friday afternoons because that's pretty much guaranteeing nobody's going to read it. Um, I know I'm not very enthusiastic to get uh, an important email on Friday afternoon and then I'm kind of checked out for the weekend and then Monday morning. I don't know. That seems kind of bothersome to start my day with that. So um, typically I like to issue my status reports midweek. Right. So maybe I'll have my internal on a Tuesday. I'll draft up the client facing status report and issue that on a Wednesday. And when I issue that status report, um, typically I like to deliver during a status meeting with the client or the team. And so I will not potentially I'll send the status um, report through prior to the call or maybe during the call and I'll screen share and just kind of walk them through everything and then follow up. Um, with that send and action items following that report. But it's really, you're not there with the client to sort of like read it out loud to them. It's more <laughs> yeah. like um, a, a dial, a framework for that dialogue, right? Where you can say, okay, here's what we did. That was really great. And then here's what we're going to do. And are we, here's where we're at on timeline. Let's talk about this. It looks like we're ahead of schedule. So that's happened to you. No, I'm just theoretically. Uh, <laughs> nice. So yeah, I think that I think that's really sound advice. I like the idea of um, doing a screen share, um, and uh, and controlling what what the client gets to see, <laughs> rather <clears throat> rather than just sending it over to them and kind of hoping that they're looking at the part of the status report that you want them to look at. But um, yeah, from from my perspective, I mean, you're obviously doing more remote project management. Uh, typically, I'm doing not remote project management. So for me, what's really important is actually the status meeting is a chance to actually get to hang out with the clients and develop that rapport, develop the relationship. So as much as it is sharing information and level setting on where the project is at, it's also you know a chance to have some uh, you know banter about the <laughs> about stuff outside of the project so that you're beginning to develop more level of trust and friendship so that when the when you do have bad news to share it's not like you've got nothing to fall back on so i i think that's probably harder when you're remote but i don't know how do you how do you make that how do you develop rapport with clients when you're remote well, I mean, if you have your video on, you can see each other. There's a lot of body language that happens and you still talk about the same things. We still, you know, ask what they did on the weekends and, and whatnot. So I think it's still um, just as effective. But, you know, you reminded me too, in that I used to host an internal status report meeting with my team and I would literally print out the status report for them. And now in hindsight, that seems pretty extreme. But I just learned from my team that that was the only way that I could get them to read it was by like, putting it in front of their faces, and then we would walk through it. Yeah. Um, so there's no right, perfect way to do it. There's a few wrong ways you can do it. Um, but it's really important to understand what your client prefers and adapt to that as well as your internal team. Mm. So how have you got any tips from for making, <laughs> making sure your client uh, actually reads your status reports have you have you found anything that works um well definitely that status call yeah. right and then the other thing i've learned is as you mentioned earlier never miss a status report because once you do that it's sort of like um a bad restaurant review like you can have one bad review but you need to have like seven more positive reviews to get it right Mm. Um, and they will always hold that against you that you miss that one week. Yeah. So just make sure that you're always on time, 
that you're prepared and that that status report is of substance. Um, it reflects, you know, the work that you guys do as well. So don't hustle to get it done. Make sure that it's clear of um, errors. Make sure that you're not uh, calling anybody out for poor work on that thing and uh, that it's of substance. Yeah. So one of the one thing you mentioned just now was, um, you know, making it kind of tailoring it for the client. So, you know, making it useful to them, giving them the information that they need. But I've had some pretty, I've had some, ended up in some situations where, you know, the client just goes nuts in terms of asking for all kinds of different pieces of detail in their status report. So um, like particularly when you're working on uh, more of a time and materials based project and, you know, the client wants a breakdown of every hour of every person that worked on the project and how they spent every moment of time. Uh and that was a pain in the ass to produce because <laughs> then you have to edit everyone's comments as well. So uh, what, what kind, what's kind of your take on, you know, how much tailoring for the client is too much detail versus how, where do you sit on that spectrum of too much detail and tailoring versus not? Mm, yeah. I'm just sitting over here nodding my head because I have been there too, Ben. Um, <laughs> I think, I think a lot of times you got to follow your intuition, right? So say, for example, it's a small time and materials contract and um, it's just not very efficient for you to track all of the hours and tasks and then regroup them and do all sorts of crazy spreadsheet work. And then you just need to educate and inform the client as to why. If they're still very insistent, like, for example, maybe there's business reasons why they need to track that way. You need to work... Um, with them potentially to increase your funding, or it means that we might not be able to get as many tasks done because we have to be spending our time on this report versus uh, the actual project work. Yeah, I think I think that's really sound advice. We obviously, if the client wants wants something to be done, like producing status reports is work, and clients might not like to see it as work. And I, in fact, I have worked for clients before, and somehow in the contracts, I made it so that. They didn't pay for the production of status reports, which is which is crazy. But um, I think clients need to understand that if we are going to produce lots of uh, detail in the status reports and all this extraneous reporting, which isn't really necessary to delivering the project well, then they should pay for it, and that should be a change request if they if they start asking for more detail in the status reports. All we need to say, yeah, like you said, something else has to drop out the scope. It's a uh, Otherwise, it will very quickly eat away at our budget. But Absolutely. It- and I just want to jump in and say, too, that, you know, always ask your client and your team for feedback, though, on these status reports, because I know sometimes I may put something out there in my template format, and I think it makes total sense. But to them, maybe my engineers are like, I have no idea why you phrase it this way, or why do you yeah. include this section, or can you include this instead? So you should be tailoring, but not like you know in a very inefficient way trust your yeah guy. yeah cool well that, i think that's really helpful thanks robin and i think we've um if you go to the uh robin's post uh on the digital project manager.com you will see not only a status report example for a it is a fictitious client i believe killer kombucha uh <laughs> uh it well a, a great brand name though if someone's looking to uh, procure that domain name um there is a sample status report which you can take a look at and also we've included a template for you to download as well uh so go and check it out and start doing some status reports so there we have status reports covered off before we go robin i just wanted to chat to you quickly about um our dear dpm section of the digital project manager which now we've been running for what nearly nearly six months wow that long it is it is nearly that long and we just actually released a new uh a new question um and robin you told someone to leave their job was that wise i did it sounds very (laughs) extreme when you phrase it that way but this person who wrote in i mean they so eloquently wrote about a pretty distressing situation where they were just struggling at work. 
um, they didn't seem to be getting the support or the leadership and mentorship that they needed to grow in the role. So I think if you, if anybody reads this question, it's going to be pretty obvious that they should um, seek a new opportunity, right? Um, that's immediately where my gut was going. But, yeah. um, you know, you can't just like quit your job and like, peace out. I don't know. In my positions, usually I can't do that. Um, I have a family. But, you know, I gave her some tips about what to do in the meantime, he or she. So it's about like channeling your energy and frustration elsewhere, hitting the gym. It's about not engaging um, and trying to fix the situation with this certain person in the office, like stop trying to make them cooperate when they're not going to. And then um, obviously giving some pointers about HR, right? So in the meantime, while you're looking for your next opportunity, make sure to um, write down when these instances happen in case there needs to be some escalation to HR. Serious stuff. It wasn't you that wrote in, was it, Robin? You've recently got a new job. That's suspicious. I. <laughs> oh no. No, I I feel like I can identify with every question that comes in. So yeah. um I don't know. I can <laughs> Sorry. The, They're the all me that. secretly. <laughs> yeah, this is all you. But if you have a question that you're dying to ask and you want to ask it anonymously, um head to the resources section of the digital project manager uh and you will find a section there called Dear DPM just in the uh near the top of the page. And you'll find that you'll be able to ask whatever questions you like, and your question might just get selected to be answered. So ask us a question, tell us what you're struggling with or what you need help with, and we would love uh, to give you some advice. Um, and Robin's great at dispensing that. But uh, Robin, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us. It's been great having you with us. Uh, thanks, Ben. This has been fun. And if you'd like to contribute to the conversation about status reports, if you'd like to uh, ask a question on Dear DPM, uh, head over to the digitalprojectmanager.com and make sure that you join our Slack team too. Head to the resources section and you'll find more than a thousand other PMs talking about this kind of stuff. And there's lots of interesting conversations going on there that you should be a part of. But until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs>